I read this story in the newspapers today. Maybe some of you did, maybe you didn't. Um, actually, again, I've got to confess, I didn't really read it in the newspaper. I'm getting convicted every time I open my mouth here. But it's a good story. An Irish priest is driving down to New York for a service on Good Friday, and he gets stopped for speeding in Connecticut. The state trooper smells alcohol on the priest on the breath and then sees an empty bottle of wine on the floor of the car. He says, Sir, have you been drinking? Are you just water? Says the priest. Fingers crossed. crossed. The trooper, the trooper says, then why do then, I smell wine? The priest looks at the bottle and says, oh, says, good Lord, he's done it again. Uh, Monica. Honestly, I need a church with a sense of humor. That was funny. Funny. That was, I expected a bit more from you, Rod. Anyway, welcome to our Good Friday uh, service this morning. We're going to get into it. We're going to get out the door by 10.30 today. When we finish, by the way, if you want to hang around over tea and coffee and chat, that's fine. So when we say we're finishing at 10.30, it doesn't mean we're booting you out. Uh, if you want to hang around, you can, but it just means that we'll be finished here and, and we want you to can move on on 10.30. If you're like me, um, the term Good Friday doesn't really doesn't seem like an appropriate name for today. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. It doesn't seem like an appropriate uh, moniker um, to remember the most barbaric and humiliating death of the most influential man that ever existed in human history, Jesus Christ. I want you to do want, something for me. I want you to imagine for a second that you're standing there at the foot of the cross 2,000 years ago. You're watching an innocent man suffer. You're watching the crowds wailing and crying, including the mother of, of Jesus, one of the men up on the cross. You're watching the religious leaders disgusting and mocking, rubbing their hands together, thinking we've won. It's over. Watching the Roman soldiers perform their gruesome duties, not just on Jesus himself, but the two feet, two feet on the side of him. Now, I don't think, I don't think that if you were standing there, you would have ever you would have imagined this day would be immortalized under the banners under the good. I don't think anybody standing there on that day, on that day would have watched what seen unfold and thought, thought, this is a good day. In fact, we know that most people present, present think it was a good day. day. When Jesus was taken, taken to be crucified, the disciples ran, ran, not to him, but away from him, thinking something's being disrupted here. Uh, we thought, thought life was going to go in this direction. Now it's going now it's this way. Hindsight is a beautiful thing. And it's going to be it's gonna day in three days' time. And all of a sudden, what's happening, happening in front of the eyes of the crowd is going to start to take shape and form, and it's going to start to make more sense. Well, we sit here today, a thousand years later, with the beauty of hindsight, hindsight. and we don't have to wait till Saturday to understand why this made a good Friday. Amen? Amen? Why this is a good day. It was a good day for Jesus because, because he was about to be reunited with his father in heaven. When Jesus was being crucified, he invited Jesus had spoken already or to tell the people, anyone that would listen, that would all be crucified. But it's okay because okay I'm going to raise again. I'm God. It's a bit hard to kill God. So, yeah, you're going to see some season. I'm going to experience and feel and so on. It's going to be painful and gruesome and grotesque. And, and it's going to be mind bending and bending to understand. But I want you to know, you to know I have every confidence that at the back end of that, I'll be reunited with my Father in heaven. So it was a good day in one sense for Jesus. But it was also a good day for the rest of the humanity as well, because through because that death, we all now have the opportunity also to be reunited with our Father in heaven as well, because of what Jesus Christ did on that cross. Anyone remember the old story or story rhyme? And 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 if you could see what goes on up here, it's on arms, it's like a circus. But at the start of the week. This nursery rhyme story stuck into my head, and I haven't been able to get it out of my head out of week. And, and, and it goes like this: There was an old lady who swallowed a fly. Sing with me. I I don't know why she swallowed she fly. Perhaps she'll die. Perhaps she'll die. There was an old lady who swallowed a spider. Wriggled and tickled and tickled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Fly. Perhaps she'll die. And this nursery rhyme goes on and on and on and on. She goes in the end, she swallows a horse to catch the cow. And she swallowed the cow to catch the goat. She swallowed the goat to catch the dog. She swallowed the dog to catch the cat. She swallowed a cat to catch the bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider. And she swallowed the spider to catch the fly. 
And in the end, we'll end this amazing mystery, this unsolved mystery of mysteries. Is why did she swallow a fly? What? We don't know. What we do know is that she did something that started this series and sequence of events. That eventually, the last line goes, I know I don't want to swallow a horse. She's dead, of course. She began something, and we don't know why, but she swallows a fly, and it began a series of events that in order to try to make herself better, she tried something else to fix the problem. And guess what happened? It didn't fix the problem. So she tried something else to fix the problem, but it didn't fix the problem. And she moved on to something else to try to fix the problem, but it didn't fix the problem. And it's the picture of a woman who, woman, again, we don't know why, why she swallowed the fly. But what we do know is it started this started series of events where she went from one thing to another to try to fix the problem that she had in the first place. First, and at the beginning of the week, that popped into my head, and I'm thinking, why can't I get this poem out of my head? I mean, I haven't heard it or seen it for so long. For so long. And then it began to dawn on me at the back end of the week, you know, that is the perfect backdrop back for Good Friday. I don't know what no, Adam and Eve, in the beginning, the first created beings, if you're a Christian here and you, you believe you, God created mankind, and I, do, and I do, in the beginning, God created God's man, and man has this perfect, perfect relationship with God. With God. Walking around in a round place that the ancient artists call the Garden of Eden. And what's amazing about that is, you know, sometimes when we think about God and who God is, God go on, we think about mammals. We think about sin. So many conceptions about what is most on the heart of God, what is of primary importance to God. And when, and when I talk to people that don't have a, a Christian background or faith, and they, just, and they hear what they hear and see what they see, they, those two things stand out quite a lot. That, that this whole thing is a thing. God is angry at sin. And, 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 it, and it's all about all rules. Because you're going to sin, I tell you, you can't do this, and you must, and you. Must. And it's 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 rules, and it's and yet I go back to the garden of the garden, and God only gave them one rule. Amazing. In the beginning, of God's perfect world, there was only one thing He said, "Don't do." And that there's a tree over there. Don't touch it. Touch it, and you have a whole playground to play. To play. Just don't touch the one tree. I don't know why she sliced a fly, and I don't know why. Two people made in the age of God fell for a lie of the devil when he said, if you eat of that, it will be like God. They were made in the image of God. And they were tricked into believing by disobeying God, you'll become more like God. God. You can't get much more like God than being made in his image. Not the side of heaven. I don't know why don't you swallow a fly. And the truth is, I don't know why Adam and Eve swallow his fly. I thought of that then. That's pretty cool, actually. I'm going to patent that one. I don't know why they swallow this. Why? Perhaps they'll die. They'll... Gee, that's good, isn't it? Good, isn't it? I've got to take some notes on myself for myself. Send myself an offering. She got herself in a situation. She won the story that she couldn't get herself out of. She tried and tried and tried, but she couldn't. Could. In fact, the more she tried, the worse the situation got. Parallel that to the case of humanity. We do a similar thing. We... I don't know why in the beginning we thought that life without life God would be better than life with God. But we made that choice. That, and in the beginning, man walked away from the world. And in doing so, created a barrier between us and God. And, and that's that thing that in church, church, and church world, we, we call it we call sin. And sin is this, is this thing that caused a barrier, a brick wall, brick wall, go up between us and God. God is perfect and God is holy. God has never made a mistake. We'll never make a mistake. God is not a mistake. God is absolute, total, total perfection, way beyond any kind, any concept of perfection our human finite finds can imagine. That's God. It almost, it almost feels almost impossible for us as human beings to talk to another human being about the concept of God because God is so outside of the bound of these of anything we can compare him to. Yet we do our best with human companions and so on. Isaiah, 59, 50 verse 2, Isaiah was a prophet. He spoke six to seven hundred years before Jesus ever came on the scene. Now, Isaiah made this statement about this thing, about this sin, this, this, this action where we choose to go in a different in a direction than what God desires for us to go and God created us to go. And he says, he says, your iniquities or your sins have separated you from God. You have been separated from God. 
by the things that we have done wrong. Sin means making the mark. And yes, God has a God has, God has a standard. And God's standard is standard, total, absolute perfection. Isn't it a hard one to reach up to reach? As a matter of fact, it's a matter of fact, hard. It's impossible. And I think that was part of the passage Jesus when he came and walked the earth for three, the earth three years and he preached for the last three lives. Part of his message was God's standard is impossible to reach. Yes, it is impossible to reach. And for those of you who think you can reach, you can see religion is a man is a concept. There are there are thousands and thousands of religions on planet Earth, and religions are all about all about what can we do to appeal to God to get His attention, to get His affection, to make Him like us again, again. What can we do to get us to get right in the sight of God? What works, what efforts, what sacrifices, what sacrifices can we do to make ourselves right with God? See, religion is about man's effort to try to climb back up to God. The story of Jesus is God's effort. God reached down to man. And when Jesus came, part of his message is people stop trying and reach up to God. You're not good enough. You'll never be able to do it. See, we have all these religious rules and systems in place, and if we just do and do and do and do and don't and don't, then God will be happy. Will be happy. Jesus said, "It doesn't matter what you do; it will never be good enough." Let me give you some examples. He said, "You have heard it said that if you kill somebody, your body of sin. But I say to you, if you hate somebody." You are guilty as if you had done the actual actual. And everyone sitting there goes, well, I've never murdered anybody. I hope you haven't. If you haven't, that's sweet too. God forgives God. I'm just... But I'll guarantee I'll guarantee not a person in this room. At some point, you have point hated somebody. It is like cutting them off for going, you're dead to me. You're dead even though you're alive. I've killed of my heart. Well, Jesus said, if you've hated someone, you might as well have physically done the act. Now, in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of the legal, in the eyes of your neighbor, the person next to you, they're two entirely different things. Different they? Not in the eyes of God. He's of God. It's a different. Jesus said, you've heard it said that you don't commit adultery. You don't chase don't to somebody else's husband or wife. Or wife. But he says, I'm telling you, I don't you, I, if there's another male or female, female, anyone that you in your mind have gone there with and thought those kind of thoughts. Kind of, he said, you might as well have done the action. In the eyes of the law, you haven't. In the eyes of yourself, maybe even in the eyes of your neighbor, they're two totally different things. In the eyes of in the odd, they're one thing because God's, because God's a way higher than our than it's. God's standard, God's way higher than ours. He doesn't see things, things the way that we th- see things. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts, not different. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways, not than your different. Sometimes we just think God is this God is different being. He's different. He's not different. He's, not, he's higher. Higher. And our sins have separated us from God. Once mankind broke the only, the only they were given, the writer of Jesus tells us this. It says that God had the had angel... And some flaming flames. Can you imagine that? Something like something out of, out of the rings. When Adam when were removed from the garden, from the presence of God because of their sin, so intense was the passion and desire to get back to the presence of God that God had to put angels and flaming swords at the entrance to stop them getting back in. The writer of Ecclesiastes says it this way. He says, God has made everything beautiful in its full time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts. There's something in the something heart of man. There's something in some part of humanity that knows deep down in the quiet moments when we're all alone, all, when the drugs are worn off, the party the music has died down, when the feelings are feeling, when we're just alone with our own thought. thought that there's something more to more. There has to be. There has to be something more to this existence than what I can see, taste, touch, feel, or smell. There has to be something more than chasing after the next big thing. There has to be something more than becoming more popular pop, or getting more followers on Twitter or Facebook. There has to be something more than the more promotion at work. There has to be something more than saving for the next holiday. Oh, there has to be something more than getting the, get the, the next car or the next shopping shop. There has to be something more than what this material world can offer. There's something more. more. It's eternity in our hearts. And people go from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing to try to fill the void with all these other things and it's up empty. When we, uh, me and my wife, come married, we lived in Bundaberg. And I remember in Bundaberg one day reading a story in the newspaper about this young guy. Young guy. He was a football player. He was the most popular guy around. He was big. He was buff. He just bought this brand new, expensive, fancy car. Car the 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 you know glamour girlfriend, fiance, and so on. And one day he drove to a park by the river and climbed up. Climbed, he tied a neck around, a rope around his neck and his neck. So, I think you know there are there are people there are people, gravestones all around the world. The world. 
screaming out, trying to say to those who are living, hey, all of that stuff doesn't meet that deep need inside of us. I had it all and it still was not enough. There's something in some hearts that craves more. And what it is, it's, it is, goes right back to that garden where we come to be back in the presence of God. Whether we can whether we articulate it that way or not. Just, about, just everything that humans do is to, is to find this elusive thing called peace. Called Jesus talked about peace. Jesus actually said, I've got a I can give you. He said, I'll give you peace, not like the world gives you. He says the peace of the world is equal to whatever that thing is that you felt brought felt peace to you. If you think you've got peace, you might find that pretty girl. And then when that pretty girl got the peace was stapled to the back of her head, her head, you took it with you. You think peace is, 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 is found when you found that million dollars. Well, guess what? When that million dollars comes your way and you suddenly you see peace, guess what? Peace is stapled to that. Well, that million dollars is gone. You're left without peace again. Jesus said, Jesus, peace I give you is not like the peace of the peace. I offer you I have peace. That comes because you are because you're in right relationship with God. You are basically living back in the place where you were created you were to live in the first place. And that is in relationship with a God that loves us. In this man's effort to try to reach up to God, up to Jesus, was God's effort to reach down to reach man. God knew that there was nothing to do to get ourselves out of the situation we got ourselves in. We ran we like the woman. We swallowed a spider. We swallowed a bird. We swallow a dog. We keep following all these things, thinking it's going to fix the perfect, but it never does. And inevitably leads to death. God knew that we couldn't get that, get that out of our throat. And so God decided to get with a plan to get the fly out of our throat. He came up with a plan to replant this barrier called sin. sin. To do this, God has to uphold these two sides to his nature. He has to uphold justice and he has to uphold mercy. God is just because the wages of sin is death. Is death. Imagine, I mean, a society with no justice. You could do whatever you do with it, and nobody's going to punish you for it. Imagine what that society would be like. Thomas Aquinas, he was an Italian a philosopher and theologian in the 13th century. Thomas Aquinas said this. He said, he said mercy without justice is the other of disillusion, and justice without mercy is cruelty. What he meant was this, that mercy without mercy, justice, he said, without justice, society will eventually dissolve and break and break. You've got to have justice. There has to be parameters, there has to be boundaries, there have to be consequences for when things done. I mean, how many, when we raise our children, one of the first things we do when we're raising our children is we start trying to try to direct them. And part of that process is, this is inappropriate, that's appropriate, that's, that's right, that's good, that's bad, bad. It's part of the process of raising children. Mercy without justice, uh, society will dissolve. But the other side is trying to do. Justice without mercy has create a society that's heartless and legalist, legal. And legalistic. In order for God to do something for us, it's central to the character of God that He needs to up and needs both sides of His nature. Through the death of Jesus, that's exactly what He did. Justice. It says in Romans 3 23, 20, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I hate to break this to you, but when it says all, it says, that means you. And it means and it, we have all fallen and fallen short of the glory of God. God. It doesn't say we've sinned and fallen short of the glory of the person sitting next to you. In other words, they set the standard there, the bar, and the bar, and you look across, and Katie comes and looks and goes, oh, well, compared to him, I'm pretty good, I've, you know. Compared to Adam, whew, I'm an angel, I've got wings, I've got a halo, halo, you know. It doesn't say that we've fallen short of the glory of the, of the person. It doesn't say we've fallen short of the glory of our culture or our society. We've fallen short of the glory and standards of God. And it says, all, and it says have every single person, every person. Whether you're a religious person, just non-religious person, whether you're black, white, black, yellow, green, red, rich, poor, it poor doesn't matter. The Bible is very inclusive, inclusive of its language, and this is one of those inclusive statements. All of us have sinned, and every single one of us have fallen short of, short of God, meaning every single one of us deserves the wrath of God's justice. Every one of us deserve it. Every one of us. Hebrews chapter 9, chapter 9 verse 22, the writer says this, It says to the law, almost all things are thingified by blood, and without the shedding of shed, there can be no Remission or forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Isn't it interesting? I was talking to talking the other night, and they were talking about a TV show that they watch, and I, I don't watch the show. Watch the, um, they were watching the show, and it was ancient times, and and talking about this barbaric practice and things that went on within this culture. These blood sacrifices that would take place. And isn't it interesting that thing right across cultures there seems to be this be the theme of, of blood and redemption, whether it be a Christian culture or not. Right throughout human history, there's been this, there's been this thread, this theme of, of blood being shed for the forgiveness of sin. It's interesting. It's 
It's almost like there are certain things about things about that are so evident and so and so, and so entrenched in culture that you can't wipe them away and say they never exist. Every so will saturate the world with it, so that it kind of loses its meaning. We'll water it down a little bit. It's like it's like getting to a point of, of, of trying to say God is dead, and then realizing that that when God God Jesus came to Earth, He exposed Him to historical examination and scientific examination. When God put thoughts down in this book called the Bible, Bible open to archaeological examination. God has no problem being examining because He knows it'll come up trumps. And so we can't convince the world that God, the world's not dead. So what do we do? Well, we just it's just saying God doesn't exist. We now redefine read God is. Because it's just so saturated throughout human kind. Anthropologists are yet to discover an ancient tribal civilization that they should not have some sense of awe about the divine. It's intense because eternity is in the heart of the hand. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. So how does God, God hold justice? Well, here's the thing. You and I have sworn on. Somebody has to pay. There has to be a shedding of blood for that. And so God, God comes to earth as a man in the form of Jesus. Jesus goes through the most gruesome, gruesome grotesque and barbaric death hanging on the cross and sheds his blood. blood. And in the economy of God, God looks down and says, Radio, justice has been served because your sins have now been paid for. You now don't have to pay for them because as far as justice goes, somebody has paid for them and his name is, his name is Christ. And God wants to have mercy. In Isaiah 53, 5, I'll find this verse again, six, seven hundred years before Jesus came, and Isaiah is speaking into the future about the Messiah that was to come. I think there's, there's really 70 to 100 prophecies in the book of Isaiah that Jesus Christ has killed six to seven hundred years later. later. That. God's speaking to somebody, some speaking about into a culture, a time where those people are going, you must be, must be really loony off your nut. Don't get it. 700 years later. Christ comes, lives his life, dies on a dos, and they go, wow, that dude was on the money, wasn't he? Hey, that dude, that on the money. And here's what he says what he, in Isaiah 53, 5, 5, he was wounded. Speaking of Jesus, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Let me, let me break this down a little bit. I want to write some words here. He, he was wounded for what? Ours. It wasn't his. It wasn't his. We can personalize. He was wounded for my my transgressions. Jesus was bruised for my iniquities. He went through through I should be going through. He copped what I should cop. cop. He endured what I should endure. And he took it upon himself. And he did that that for me. He did that for you. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? What a loving, love, gracious God. And, and, and so through the cross, God fulfills both of his nature. There's justice because it's the shedding of blood for the forgiveness for sins. But there's mercy because he didn't do it to you. He didn't do it to you. So justice and there's mercy being served up right there. Paul puts it this way in his letter to the Romans. Some of beautifully in Romans 6, 23, 23. He says, for the wages of sins of death. But the gift, but the God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Of that passage. For the wages of sin is death. Wages are what you deserve. Justice. You deserve death. And I deserve death. But the gift of God, it's a gift. There's wages, there's what we deserve, and there's a gift. There's justice, but there's mercy. Put it, in other words, put it another way. It's like God saying, there's what you should get, get given to you. And then there's one there's I want to give to you. You should get death, death but I want to give you life. You just you this, but it's in my heart my, as your heavenly father and creator, creator give you that. It's in my heart to give you this, something that you don't deserve. We sang that song, Amazing Grace. If we could understand what we deserve, then maybe they would start to understand and get a glimpse of how amazing that grace is. It's not just something we sing about. It's something we walk in and live in every single day of our lives. The grace of God. This is what this deserve to be given. And then there's what I want you to be given. To. I want to close with this thought. Even though we're separated from God by our sins, sin, it's the truth. God didn't God have to do anything for us. You ever thought about that? Thought about well, when Adam and Eve Adam turned their back on God and said, we can do it, we can do it, way, thank you very much. And built this brick wall called sin between them and God. 
At that point, God could have gone, well, that's a well, that's an experiment. I'm going to go to, I'm going to go and see if I can make something over there. Of course he could. I would put some air into the, into the atmosphere and I'll start again. But there was something, some heart of God that couldn't let us go. Go. We're made with his image and he loves us. We have this DNA, the fingerprint, finger of God. No matter what you feel about yourself about this morning, you have the fingerprint of God in your life. Imperfections and all. All. As Brennan, as Brennan says, God loves us as we are and not as we should be for none of us, none as we should be. But he loves us anyway. God didn't have, didn't do anything for us, so why did he? Why did he? Well, well, it's the most obvious thing in Christianity today. today it comes from the most memorized and well known and famous biblical passage that there is out there, John 3, John 3. For God what? So love so, who the world us. It doesn't say that God was so jacked off, jacked off, just so brassed off, and angry about the wicked the and the evil in the world. The focus of the cross is not sin. Sin just happens to be the thing that's standing between God and His main focus. Main was us. God loves us. But in order to get back into relationship with us, he had to deal with sin. If it was just about sin, then dealing with sin would be the full stop. That would be that. Would be. But sin is not the full stop. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten begotten. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, see, God wants us to have life. Sin stops us from having a relationship with the one that gives us life. So in order for God to get God life to us, of course he's got to deal with the sin issue. And Jesus dies upon that cross and tosses upon himself the punishment that you that I deserve from God. God. So that you and I can be set free. So that the wall between you and God can be torn down and you can walk towards God now and you have a relationship with him. Created, part of. You could say, because only son. Only one of them. God loves you so much. Good Friday is a reminder, people, that Jesus died on a cross not to take away sin, sin stop, but to take up to sin so that you and I could come back could come to a relationship with God and experience life as he wants, he wants to. God so loved the world, he gave his gave begotten son so that at the end of it we wouldn't perish, but we would have, have a lasting life. Isaiah 53 and verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was wounded for our iniquities, but it's not a full stop. Then it says this, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Stripes, we're healed. He says, I've got, to deal, I've, got to deal, I've got to deal with transgressions, to deal with iniquities. But once they're out of there, here's what I want to do. I want to give you peace and peace home. There's no full stop at sin. I want you to, to go to today and I want you to think about that. Good Friday is not just about just Jesus dying on a cross to take away sin. sin. Full stop. It's Jesus dying on a cross to remove your sin so that he can give to you the life that he wants you to have. So he can have, bring to your life the healing and the whole that he wants you to have. What are we what are we in response to that? We have a part to play. play. We need to make the decision to accept what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. It's all been done. There's nothing else else needs to be done from God's side of our defense. In God's economy, it is literally finished. Now it comes back to us. What are we going to do with this great act of love, love and compassion that God did for us? For God sent his son to die for us. What are we going to do with that? We've got two choices. Just, yeah, that's a great story. That's all. That's awesome. Thank you, God. But I'm going to keep on keep living the way I want to live, doing my own thing and this thing. Guard what you did for me. Or we can stand in awe of that word. We can stand in awe stand of the value that God gave to us by sin by his only son. The most precious, most valuable thing you could possibly pay. pay. When Jesus died on the cross, on the cross it was a value add to you. It was God's way of saying, this is how valuable you are. You, even you dirty, rotten sinners, sinners, don't even think about me. This is how much I think about you. This is how much value you value my eyes. And our response to that, to that, is to humbly come to Jesus and go, you know what? Thank you. Thank you.
that you died for my transgressions. Thank you that you died for your iniquities. Thank you that you, you moved that wall of separation that stood between stood me personally. We've got to personalize it. It stood between me and stood before God. For, and because of what you did, that wall is torn down. Thank you that you died for me. And as a response to that, I'm going to turn my life back to, back to God. And I'm going to surrender my life to God. I'm going to live my life down here to the best of my ability, the way that God wants me to live. And God made a promise. He said, I'll send my spend my to infill you, to be inside of you. You're not just trying to do this in your own strength. I'm to empower you to live the kind of life that I want you to live. That's the promise of God this morning. And each of us here, I don't know where your heart is, your heart is God. But if you're in your place today and you have not made that decision to your heart to follow after Jesus, I urge you and encourage you that today, that Good Friday, what a great day to make that decision. As we talk about, look about, look about, and think about the great length that God went to through Jesus, Jesus to create a space for you to be able to do that in the first place. Not because he gets anything, anything. God doesn't become more God because more people more follow him. It's not like Twitter, you know? you know? The more people that follow you, the more they feel, feel important. And the more people that follow God, he, God he, every, with every new like, important. God is God. God will stop. And he loves you. Amen. Let's close our eyes. For Let's close your eyes. I just want to ask in this room, just once, is there anybody here this morning you have not given your life to Jesus Christ? You have not surrendered your life to him. You have not understood or accepted what Jesus did for you on this day 2,000 years ago. And you've not made the decision to turn your life over to him and to walk into with God for the remainder of your days. To receive forgiveness, he can remove and remit and shame, all that stuff. You've not made that decision. I'm only going to ask it once. If you're in this room today and that's you, I'm just going to ask you, going to raise your hand, you put it in the air, put it back down. I'm not going to make a scene, I'm not going to get you. I'm going to get you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, if there's other people here and you haven't made a decision, and you're not walking with the Lord, I just good. God loves you. And if you think about Jesus Christ today, think about the fact that he hung on that cross and he did it for you. Father, thank you for this morning, God. Thank you for your word. For you. Thank you for your presence. God, thank God for the un... un it's, it is an unreal, it's an unbelievable sacrifice that you did for us, God. God. That you would come to come, that you would humble yourself, that you would meet by such a gruesome death for us. God, knowing what's going in hearts, knowing what we do, knowing, knowing our propensity to go the wrong way, wrong way, that, that, that Father, we have done have terrible things and we'll continue to as you taste, do terrible things. We will continue to reject you. But yet you did that for us. That anyway, Father, we are in awe this morning, this morning at the amazing grace of God. Of God. And Father, for each person in this room, I pray as we go through this one again, Lord, let this Easter be different. Let this Easter not just be a big cross buns and chocolate eggs. Let it not just be about a Friday gathering and a Saturday gathering, gathering. Lord, this Easter, would you open our eyes, give us all a greater and a greater, deeper uh, revelation of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ means for us in this life. life. And Father, we ask that we ask in Jesus' name. Everybody said, said, Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Uh,